Good morning and welcome to this, the Wednesday morning Bible study and meditation at Velder Rose United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Anne. I am so glad that you are joining us for this time to be together. Frequently, I'm joined by Pastor Daniel. He was feeling a little under the weather yesterday. He is recovering, but he's just taking his time so that he can be um, at peak when he preaches this Sunday. I want to start us off with a psalm today. We haven't been doing that, but I thought it would be good. This is Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure, for you do not give me up to shoal or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. One of the reasons I chose this particular psalm is because of what I'm going to read for you next. This is entitled, A Prayer to Make Space for the Divine, a response to Psalm 16. This was written by a friend of mine. His name is Rich Orloff. He is a playwright and poet. As it is possible to walk through a field without seeing the grass, so it is possible to walk through life without seeing the divine. I do not wish to believe in you, what I desire is to experience you, not an idea in a prayer book, but a presence I can touch, not above me, but beside me, opposite me, facing me, surrounding me, inside me, not me, but available to me. Even if you are beyond definition, you are always within reach. Let me make a place for you. Let me be open to your voice. As I venture into scary places, let me sense you alongside me. My prayer is simple. Let your breath become my strength. Amen. Beautiful words. Bringing scripture to life for us. We are in the midst of our series entitled Emerge. Our primary image is, as you see beside me, the butterfly. The idea that we start out as one thing, much as a caterpillar does, and that God transforms us into new beings in Christ, the butterfly. Our scripture this week, we're actually going to have two on Sunday. One will be the Ascension, but the other is this one from Mark chapter 2. We're beginning with verse 1. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? It is it easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. 
And he stood up and immediately took the gnat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So the oldest of the Gospels, believed by scholars to be the oldest of the Gospels, and being short, it moves pretty quickly in the events of Scripture. In the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we have the baptism of Jesus, and immediately he goes into performing so many different signs and healing so many people in just that one chapter that everyone in the area has heard about Jesus and they begin to follow him. And I don't mean follow him in the sense of being disciples, but follow him like fans. They're, it's a crowd that is going with him to see what it is that Jesus can do and particularly what can Jesus do for them. So there's all this fuss and it becomes even upsetting and dangerous. And so in chapter two, we see the first of things that are really going to start to shift things for Jesus, where instead of being this object of veneration as he is in chapter one, we start to foreshadow the troubles that are going to come. And those are troubles between Jesus and the religious leaders. And here we see the very first of those where Jesus is being accused, albeit quietly in their hearts, of blasphemy. How dare Jesus say, that someone's sins are forgiven. And of course, that's going to turn around and that's going to become the reason ultimately why he is turned over for execution to the Romans so that he will become a death, the ransom for many. Now, in this story, we see Jesus is being just really impressed by the faith of the friends who have lowered this man down to him. Their faith is an active, is showing care and compassion and friendship to this person who really is excluded from the life of the community. He's not working. He's not part of the financial world. He doesn't have um, that work that would normally tie people together. And he sees their effort as one of collective faith. Scripture said when Jesus saw their faith, the, the faith of the ones who are up on the roof lowering him down, he says to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. It is the community of faith that is paying, playing the role in this man's healing. Regrettably, the community of faith is shrinking in our time. We see it becoming less and less important instead of more so, to the point that here in the modern West, we don't talk quite as much about community. We don't see faith as a community event as much. Instead, we see faith as an individual Thing. We talk about our sins being forgiven and us getting into heaven instead of talking about it in the community. The chief obstacle to that, I think, is the busyness of our lives and our schedules. We no longer spend as much time together as a community. And I don't just mean a faith community, I mean a community as a whole. Our working lives take up most of our waking time. We don't see people gathering the way they used to. Um, we populate our lives with the things that we must do today. We have to-do lists. We don't see schedule, people scheduling time to gather together to see the miracles of God. But here in this story, of course, we have the reverse, right? Jesus is present in the lives of all of those people who have gathered and indeed in the lives of the paralytic and his friends. Jesus is ready to breathe out onto them his living word, just as Jesus is ready to do that for us. So what should we do? One of the lessons out of this story is that we need to do what the friends of the paralytic did. We need to make time to be in the presence of the holy. We need to make time for Jesus to be near us, for his word and his presence to touch our lives. Now, these friends of the paralytic... They can't actually get into Jesus. The house is so full of people, they're spilling out the doors and they can't get in. Imagine a, a concert where it's just standing room only. That's the situation here. And so they go up onto the roof of this house. We're not told quite how they get there and it must be a thatched roof because they're able to get through the roof and lower the paralytic down. Imagine if we could 
tear apart or tear down that which is separating us from God so that we could break through to the good news that is waiting for us there in God's presence. Now, I want to offer a word of caution here. When we read these healing stories, it can be tempting, and indeed some would even say, that we just have to have faith enough. We need to overcome the obstacles and God will heal us just as Jesus healed this paralytic. And we come across this situation where people were told if they would just have enough faith, they, like the paralytic, could walk. But that is a misread of this story. Jesus does not heal the paralytic because of faith. He, in fact, he heals him because of a lack of faith. He forgives his sins because of the faith. And then because the scribes, those are people who work in the temple, religious leaders, do not see the miracle that Jesus has done, in fact, accuse him in their hearts of blasphemy, Jesus provides the sign of the healing to help their unbelief. Now, healings can happen. I know people who have experienced that in their own lives, who have seen healing happen. But we also know that healings don't always happen. And so I don't want people to think that if they only had enough faith, there could be healing. Healing happens for various reasons and in various circumstances. And sometimes the healings we receive are in the next life rather than this one. And so we pray, as Jesus did, your will, not mine, be done. So I want you to know that just because you are suffering, that doesn't mean that God does not love you, and it doesn't mean that your faith is the problem. Sometimes it just is, and the world goes forward, and we have illnesses and injuries because of the circumstances we are in, not because of a lack of faith or a lack of action by God. We know that God is always faithful. That is who God is. And that God wants us to be well and to provide healing, but God is most concerned with our souls and our personhood. The main thing, like the paralytic, is to know that our sins are forgiven, and that is what really matters. If we are healed physically, that's an added blessing, just as it was an added blessing in this story. It is the forgiveness of sins, though, that is the grace of God. The healing in this story, as I said, was done as a sign for those scribes so that they could believe. But believers don't need signs. We know that Jesus forgives our sins, and that is the story for us, out of, or the message for us out of this story. Now, there is an interesting take on this story from a commentator, his name is Gene Marshall. He describes this as a spirit parable. And he says this, what is Mark talking about in this story? What is going on here that is so new and so amazing that it was included in the gospel? He says, Mark is talking about more than the literal elements of this story. Honestly, says Gene Marshall, who cares about whether or not some paralyzed man who lived 2,000 years ago got up on his feet. Mark is telling us that Jesus is the one who meets us, each of us, at our lowest point. And he's saying that this entire story in the Gospel of Mark is for us a parable. This man is lowered to a low point, and Jesus meets him there at that low point. When we are in despair, when we are unable to walk into our lives, Jesus meets us there and cares for us. When despair has blocked out all possibility of going on with our lives, at that point, Jesus says to us, your despair is forgiven. Everything in your past and your present life over which you are despairing is forgiven. You have right now a fresh start. Rise and walk. Mr. Marshall also talks about how the, the image here, and I want you to think about this, the picture, if you will, of lowering someone down. They're on a, on a mat, on a, a um, almost like you might see in a hospital, or, you know, or a, um, like a, a, you might have in an ambulance, something that's mobile that you can carry someone who can't walk. 
and they lower it down. Well, when do you think of somebody being lowered down? Well, that image is an image we see at funerals, right? When we are lowered into the ground. So this person is lowered down and yet gets up and walks. So we have that imagery of coming back to life, coming back into the fullness of being. Every story in Mark's narrative, so every story in the Gospel of Mark can be read as a parable about our spirit lives. It's not in opposition to the text, it was the purpose of the text. When these Gospel stories were written, they were not written as history books to be read in a, a scientific manner, but rather they were to be read as stories of truth, of truth even greater than the words themselves. Mark says that we are to see ourselves in that scripture. And so where are we when we're being lowered down? And who is it who's supporting us in that time? That's our community. Those are the people of faith who help us to see God in, even in our time of despair so that we too can be healed and walk and move on in our lives. We see this because it is so. If we have found with our spirit eyes, then we will see it for ourselves. Mark uses the parable method of communication to force us to use our own spirit resources to see what he is saying. If we don't see for ourselves the truth of scripture, says Mr. Marshall, we don't see the truth of scripture. And we don't see that it deserves to be the scripture in our religion. Scripture is always speaking to us from a metaphor and we should try to find ourselves in it. Are we the ones who are in that low point, the point where we just don't feel like we can move on, where we feel paralyzed in our lives? Maybe though we are the ones who are carrying another. Maybe we are called to be the ones who carry that person into the place of faith so that they can indeed get up and live a new life. Where is the transformation in this story? Well, there's the transformation in the paralytic, obviously, but there's also the transformation in Jesus as one who is seen now as forgiving sins, transformation in the lives of those who have carried this person and who have cared for him and been community for him and brought him into the presence of the divine. And we're gonna ask this weekend at our own worship, where is our transformation in this story? So much to be gleaned from what at first glance appears to be something quite simple. I hope you will join us on Sunday when we continue looking at this story and we will also be looking at the ascension of Jesus. We'll be celebrating the ascension on Sunday as well as we look forward to Pentecost, which is the Sunday following. Um, this year, Pentecost falls on Memorial Weekend Sunday, and we invite you to join us on that Sunday as well. Our worship is at 9.30 in the morning. You can join us here on campus if you are in the Phoenix area. We are at 5540 East Main Street in Mesa, Arizona, or you can worship with us online. I do hope you'll join us as we move forward in our story, Emerge. Now. I invite you to join me in prayer as we close this Wednesday service, as we always do with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Blessings to you this day and always.